Good family, good family. Come on in the room. Come in the room. We're going to get started tonight. Come on, come on, and we will get started with Bible study. As you were coming on, okay, I see Alicia Davis Neal is in the house. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It is Bible study time. So come on and get online tonight. As you're coming, if you have your Bibles, we'll be in the book of James, the fourth chapter. Again, as you're coming on, if you have your Bibles, we'll be in the book of James, the fourth chapter. Again, as you're coming on, we're in the book of James, the fourth chapter. Dr. Fry is in the house. New member Carol's in the house. Cassandra is in the house. Yes, ma'am. Alicia Davis, Neil in the house. Good stuff. Uh, as you're coming on. We're going to be in the book of James, the fourth chapter. Book of James, the fourth chapter. I've got 6.32, and so we'll give it one more minute, and then we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Good evening, good evening. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Anita Alexander's in the house. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Again, we're in the book of James. Uh, tonight, we're going to be in the fourth chapter uh, of said book. Fourth chapter of the book of James. Fourth chapter. All right. So as you're coming on, um, Inez, yes, ma'am. As you're coming on, um, if there's somebody you'd like for us to pray uh, for, you can put their name in the chat. Um, as we say every single week, I'll just start praying. But what I, what I will do and what others will do is even after this broadcast is over, uh, they will go back and look at the names and pray. So if you've got somebody that you want us to pray for, um, you can go ahead and put their name in the chat. And we'll make sure that we lift them up in prayer this week. All right, let's go. Let's, let's, let's pray. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this evening. We thank you, Lord, for the sunshine, the cooler temperatures. We thank you, Lord, for how you continue to bless us and cover us. God, this is such a season of uncertainty and transition and just struggle. But we know you to be a God of peace and a God of order. And so I pray, God, that you would give us the the courage to stand still and know that you are God. I pray, God, that you would give us the courage and determination, Lord, to hold on to our peace and to hold on to our joy and to hold on to our faith, even in these difficult moments. I pray, God, for all those who are dealing with illness. I pray, Lord, for all the names that are being written, even in this chat. I pray, God, that you would continue to touch the bodies of our members and our friends and our families who are suffering. God, we know that you can do it. We know, Lord, that you are a healer, a redeemer, a restorer. We know, God, that you are Jehovah Rapha, God, who is a healer. We know, Lord, that you are Jehovah Jireh, God, who is a provider. And so, God, right now, Lord, I pray that you would touch them, that you would touch us, that you would continue, Lord, to heal us, to cover us, and to bless us. Again, God, touch these names. Dispatch your angels, Lord. Send them now to every household listening, everyone present. And God, we covenant to give you all the honor. We covenant, God, to bless your holy name. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. All right. So we're going to get straight into the word. We're going to do something different tonight. I know many of you have your, um, your books with you. Um, but we're going to go straight because I love James 4. James 4 is one of those things. So, 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 so we're going to go straight to James 4. So if you have your Bible, um, go ahead and get your Bible, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna go straight to James four, um, and just talk about some of the verses that we see. So again, we're in the book of James. We're in the fourth chapter. Uh, James was not holding back uh, in the fourth chapter, and it's funny some of the things that James mentions uh, in the fourth chapter we will often say in Christendom, but James really goes in depth. So if you have your Bibles. Uh, I want to begin, and probably which is one of the more difficult places, um, but I want to begin in James 4, verse 7. James 4, verse 7. Uh, and it reads like this. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Res 
Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. I want to talk about that scripture. I want to talk about what that means, um, how to operationalize that, and why that works. Why, why do you think the devil flees when you resist him uh, and draw near to God? Why does he flee? Let me hear some responses. Why is it that you think that the devil will flee when you resist evil and draw near to God? Why do you think the devil flees? What do you think is going on? Again, the question is, why is the devil running when you start resisting and drawing near to God? What's, what's happening? Why, why does he flee? The devil can't compete with God. That's very good. You on point. That's right. The devil can't compete with God. Why, why else might he flee, though, Anita? He, he, you're right. He cannot compete with God. But why else does, why does the devil flee when you resist him and start going to God? He knows the Lord is powerful. That's right. He knows he already lost. And when you won't talk to him and consider his ways, that's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. But can I, can I, can I, let me hear some more. Uh, we cleanse our hearts and we have room for God. That's, that's true. The devil knows that the power of God firsthand. That's definitely true. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Can, can, can I suggest to you that at its most basic level, uh, 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 it is an economics issue? Let me hear some thoughts around that. At its most basic level, the reason why the devil will flee when you resist evil and turn to God at its most basic level it's a simple economics one-on-one uh, calculation. When we draw near to God, our choices and clarity is different and we change. Very true. Very true. Very true. Very true. So, so, so again, all, all of your answers are correct. All of your answers are correct. The, the, the devil senses God's power. Uh, we are no longer attracted to, to what he has to offer. Um, uh, but, 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 but he goes to easy business. All right. But, but it, it, is, it is an economics 101 issue. It is simply this. Watch this. It is supply and demand. That's it. That's it. Part of the reason the devil will flee uh, when you begin to resist him and draw near to God <laughs> it's because it's because the devil got to go some other places. And he didn't, they only made one devil, right? We we we, we often we often talk about uh, uh, demons and imps and spirits and all those kinds of things and devils and all that. But if we go back and look in the Bible, when 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 Lucifer fell from the face of earth, there was only one Lucifer. When the angels that went him went with him fell from the face of the earth. There were only but a handful of them. And so I've got news for you. There aren't that many devils. <laughs> there aren't that many demons. There aren't that many imps, right? And so, and, so, and so the devil does not have time to waste on you once you get it together and realize that God has called you the greater. And so just a, a simple economics 101, you know, he, he's got less supply. He's got to go where he knows his product can be sold. Right, right, right. And so he simply retreats because the energy he's spending on you uh, is a waste when he could be somewhere else doing some other thing. I want you, I want you to hear that, 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 they're, that, that they didn't make two devils. Right, right. That, that we, we, give, we often give the enemy more credit than he needs. We often give the enemy more authority than he has. Right. Right, right, right. The enemy is not all that powerful, right? Right. He is. He he, he isn't. We will we will ascribe things to the devil that the devil had he had, he had no no participation in. We'll say, oh, that must have been the devil. No, it was you. It was, it was you. Right, right, right. Uh, uh, Chaplin says we are no longer available. That's right. That's right. That's right. When when we decide that we are going to resist evil that we are going to turn and go towards God, what the devil says is, I've got limited supplies of demons I can let go out. And so instead of wasting my time on this person who is finally connected to God, I need to go somewhere else. 
But I want you to I want you to catch the key words because oftentimes we say resist the devil and he will flee. That's not what James shows us. What James shows us in chapter 4, verse 7, he says, Submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Watch verse 8. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Right? So to resist is to pull away. Right? If 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 someone goes to shake your hand and, and, and you don't want to and you don't want to shake their hand, you resist, right? To resist is to pull away. But to pull away to resist is different than drawing near. The devil does not flee simply because you resist. The devil flees because you have resisted and you have drawn near to God. Right? Right? It's a it's a two-parter. Right? So simply saying, well, man, I'm not going to go over such and such as house, or I'm not going to smoke this, drink this, I'm not going to do the thing I used to do. That's great. Congratulations. But if you do not draw near to God, if you don't replace what you are resisting, if you do not draw near to God, then you leave yourself open for the enemy instead of fleeing to come back. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? It's one thing to resist. It's a whole different thing to resist and to draw near to God. Y'all get that? Y'all get that? Let me hear some, 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 some responses. Chapel says we are no longer available. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. You, can, you cannot make it without them. That's right. That's right, but I want you to hear that even when we resist, we must also draw near to God. It's a two-part action, right? Simply resisting evil, resisting the devil, um, is it will not cause him to flee on his own. We must, uh, you got it, we must resist and draw. We must resist the devil and draw near to God. If the space is still there, the devil moves back in. That is 100% correct. That is scripturally based, right? If the devil pulls out, the devil flees from us, but we don't do anything to mitigate or deal with that hole, that gap, that problem, then the enemy will simply come right back in to where it used to be, right? So, so <laughs> everyone says, wow. Yeah, so, if, so resisting is great. I'm glad that you stopped the bad habit. But if you do not replace that, with something godly, if you do not turn to God, if you do not draw near to God, then you're right. You leave yourself vulnerable and open for the enemy to come right back in and do what he did again. Except this time, what the scriptures tell us is he comes back with friends seven times more. And so you wonder why we see people who go through trials and tribulations. And it seems that they keep going through the same cycle over and over again. And it seems to increase uh, each time in terms of trauma and pain. And the reason is because they, because even though they stopped the cycle, they never went the opposite direction. They just simply stopped. And so because they did not do that, they left their self, themselves open uh, to the enemy coming right back. Right? Right? Carissa says giving up bad habits and drawing closer to God makes the devil flee. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. I want you to get it. It is not simply that I have resisted evil. Uh, James 4, 7 and 8 tells me I've got to resist evil and draw near to God. If I want the devil to flee. Now, if I want the devil just to back up for a minute, um, then simply go ahead and just resist him. Right? Right? But if I want him to flee, he's only fleeing because he has recognized a higher source, a bigger source greater than him. Because remember now, James 4 and 8 says that when we draw near to God, God will draw near to us. Message version says to purify your inner life and quit playing the field. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I might not have said it like that, Dr. Brown, but I like that. Stop playing the field. Stop playing the field. <laughs> I like that. Right? But, but what the devil does is he does not flee simply because you resist. I want you to get that. The devil does not flee simply because you resist evil. The devil flees because you resisted evil and you drew near to God. So you resist and you turn. And because what he recognizes is that if the scriptures are correct, 
if you draw near to God, God will draw near to you, right? And if God is drawing near to you and you're drawing near to God, the devil has no opportunity in order to influence or empower or, or I should say overpower you. And so again, it is about not just resisting, but drawing near. So let's, let's operationalize that, right? Because that's all churchy talk, right? Resist the devil, right? Draw near, right? right. Let's, let's talk about what that might look like um, in our lives. So let's say um, I've had a, 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 a drug habit all of my life, and I've decided um, that I'm going to come off of this drug habit. Um, I'm, I'm going to give up uh, uh, the, the uh, drug. That's wonderful. Um, I've stopped doing that. That's wonderful. I've given up all the drugs. I've come off the drugs. But I've also got to enroll in some programs that help me learn how to live a sober lifestyle. I've also got to put some, some, some trusted people around me that are, keep me accountable in my sobriety. I've also got to, to change my circumstances and change my house and change my stuff so that I'm in a whole different environment so that I can live sober going forward. Y'all see the difference? Just stopping the drug or stopping the habit is one thing, but putting things around me that fill that gap that that drug was doing or fill that gap that that relationship was doing or fill that gap that that habit was doing uh, helps me to move in victory. Do y'all get it? It's so, so just breaking up with her or him, uh, just quitting the habit, just stopping the drug, um, all of that is great things, and I want you to do that. But it's got to be coupled with uh, uh, an action that draws you near to God. It's got to be coupled with an addendum that pulls you in a different direction that fills that vat, that hole that existed. If we don't do that, we wind up, as Carissa said, seven times uh, more going back and being drawn into temptation. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Erwin says, <laughs> have mercy, Lord. Yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, in fact, I'll say, I'll, I'll, I'll say this to you, Erwin. The, the enemy is counting on you not uh, a drawing near to God. The enemy is counting on you just resisting, right? Right, 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 because drawing near takes work. I mean, you think about uh, what it means to, 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 to actually draw near to God, right? Changing my lifestyle, putting putting worship first, putting my relationship with Jesus first, right? Reading and studying the Bible, curating my, 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 my social media and, and the things I ingest to make sure that they're righteous and holy. That takes work. Being mindful of what comes out of my mouth, uh, being mindful of, of what I let come into my ears and into my eyes, that takes work. Drawing near to God is work. And what the enemy is counting on uh, is that you won't do the work. The enemy is counting on you to just, for, for performance sake, tell folk that you quit. That's what the enemy wants. The enemy says, for performance sake, say, just go tell folk that, 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 that it's over. Change your status on social media. Put up a picture or a post. Right, right. Text somebody and tell them it's over. Right, for, for, for performance sake. Uh, uh, and let that be enough, because what the enemy knows is that if you're not willing to do the work of drawing near to God, then all he's got to do is wait you out, and eventually he can come right back in. And then it says, never allow bad habits to control you. Always be in control to move forward. Yes, man. We have to learn how to run to God, not from him. 100%. 100%. That's right. And it, and it is work, Inez. It's work. It is work to draw near to God. It's work to, to be consistent when it comes to our behavior, when it comes to our choices, right? And if we are willing to do the work, then we can go for it. Erwin says that's what, that's what caused the problem in the first place. But, but, but we have to do the work. That's right. That's right. Quitting caused the problem in the first place. Giving up, not completing the totality of it caused the problem in the first place. But if we are willing to do the work, then God will draw near to us. And I want to be clear. I want to be clear. We see this. We see this. Jesus gives us this um, as a parable um, with the prodigal son. Um, uh, this is a perfect parable to fit 
what we're talking about now. I want you to notice in the story of the prodigal son, and let me just give it to you real quick for those, of, for, 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 for those who don't know it. In the story of the prodigal son, the father had two sons. Um, uh, the, the youngest son got tired one day and said, I'm tired of just up, up here doing the hogs and the, and the goats and the pigs. Uh, uh, I'm ready to, to, to go out on my own, Dad. Give me half of all my stuff. Give me half of all your stuff, and I'm gone. The youngest son goes out into the world, loses all his money, all his stuff, realizes while he's in a pig pen that there's better in his father's house, gets up, uh, uh, comes to himself, goes back to his father's house. His father embraces him, brings him to the house, and restores him to his level of duty. Right? 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 That's the story of the prodigal son in, in, in a quick nutshell. But that's also the story of us. I want you to notice in the story of the prodigal son, I want you to notice positions. Right? I want you to notice that, that though the father loved his son, the father did not go to the pig pen to get his son. I want you to notice that though the father adored his son and wanted only the best for his son, the father simply went to his, the, the edge of his property and looked out for his son. He did not go to the pig pen. This is important because when, when we look back at this particular scripture in James 4, verse 8, the text says that when we draw near to God, God draws near to us. It does not say that God will draw near to us if we're trying to outrun God. It does not say God's going to run to your pig pen and while you're still doing your mess, a God's going to force you to come with him. God is not that kind of parent. God is not coming to the party and making you get back in the car. God, God ain't coming to the school with the rollers in his hair and the gown and making you. God is not that kind of parent. That, that, that ain't God. God will stand firm uh, from the balcony of heaven uh, and wait on us to come to ourselves and draw near to him. And as we are drawing near to him, God will draw near to us. And part of the reason that God will not come to your pig pen is because God cannot be where sin is. And so we have to choose to turn away from sin to come to God. Now, what God will do, and I'm giving you a lot, so please jump in. But what, what God will do is God will extend his grace and his mercy over us. Even in his, even in our pig pens, but God will not come Himself until we have decided to turn and to come near to Him. Sarah says, "Anything is possible when we put when we put in the work and our efforts and level our faith." That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. And so we have got to move from our pig pen, from our sin, back towards the direction of God. And if we will do that, then God will draw nigh to us. Does that make sense? I know that's a lot. I know that's a lot, but 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 I want you to understand uh, uh, that 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 if you're in the middle of your pig pen, you might get uh, God's grace, you might uh, have access to His mercy, but if you want His voice, if you want His presence, if you want His will, you have got to turn from your wicked ways and go back to Him. It's just the way it is, as Chaplin said. Uh, uh, God is holy, and so He must be in a holy place, right? And so in the turning and going back to Him. Then we can begin to get the things and find the things we're looking for. That's right. says more grace, more grace, right? Yeah, yeah, we all want grace. We all need grace. We all need God's mercy. But I, what I want to help us do, though, Erwin, is I want to help us move beyond God's grace and God's mercy to God's presence. Because watch this, watch this, watch this. And I just got finished. Uh, we had this conversation earlier. Watch this. Uh, God's grace and God's mercy are preventative actions. They, they are things that God does as a result of people, those being outside of his presence. Let me give you an example. Uh, this morning, I really wanted some coffee, and we ain't had no more coffee left in the house. And so me and uh, Ronald, my oldest son, uh, we got on our bicycles, and we, and we rode down the street uh, to Caribou Coffee, right? Now, I got this rule uh, that the kids have to ride right beside me when I'm riding. I'm on the outside. They're on the inside. Right. And so we're, so they're riding on the inside. I'm riding on the outside. We're going to get some coffee. Uh, we come back. We go down this steep hill. Now, mind you, Ronald and I are having conversation while we're riding the bikes talking. Right. We get to the steep hill. Now, y'all know my eight year old took off. He's he is, he, is, he is racing down the hill on his bike. 
And so instead of being able to have conversation with him, now I got to yell and scream at him to stop his bike, come to a complete stop until I get to him. Right. That's grace and mercy. Right. Because I can see a car coming that he couldn't see. I can see a car coming down the street. So I'm yelling to my son, stop your bike. Stop, stop, stop. Right. That's my grace. That's my mercy. Right. He listens. He responds to it. He stops his bike. And of course, the car goes by. and There's no issue and no problem. The, the issue, the thing is, while it's great that he had my grace and it's great that he had my mercy, it's great that he could hear my voice. His real place of protection and safety was when he was in my presence riding alongside of me, right? So what I'm trying to help us do is to move away from God's grace and mercy and instead into the presence of God, to to be with God, right? To, to, To stop waiting or trusting or hoping on grace to show up or mercy to show up, but instead to create a lifestyle where we are walking with God. And because we're walking with God in God's presence, we don't have to worry about the need for grace and mercy because I'm with the king, right? When I'm with the king, I don't have to worry about grace and mercy. When I'm with the king, I get whatever the king gets. When I'm hanging out with the king, I get to I get to feed at a different level uh, than, 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 than anyone else. What I'm trying to get us to is to get to a position where we are in his presence and not codependent on his grace or his mercy. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Dr. Pai said, great example, being in his presence. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Yes, man. Those are those are different positions to be in, right? And again, many times we find ourselves codependent on God's grace and mercy because we've chosen to be out. We have literally chosen to be outside of his presence, right? Right? We have chosen to put ourselves in positions where we're more attuned and aligned to the world and to sin than we are to the presence of God, right? And so because I'm so attuned and aligned to this world of sin, you know, I'm just hoping that grandmama's prayers and great grandmama's prayers and uncle's prayers and grandpa's prayers, I'm just hoping they're going to keep me. When in reality, I, I wouldn't have to worry about nobody else praying for me if I would just stay in alignment with God. Right, 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 right. Right. Deanna says, uh, don't have to be out there in the first place. Then we, we won't have to be out of rescue. 100%. Right, I want myself to know that at all times I'm doing right, and the people of God is right, 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 right. And so, the, and so again, the point is to be in His presence. Carla says, when I'm obedient, um, I just honestly, honestly have a better life. It's really that simple. When we are obedient, we have a better life, right? Sarah says we have to trust in God, one hundred percent. The presence is the cake. Grace and mercy is the icing. Robin, I'm stealing that from my my sermon on Sunday. I love that. The presence is the cake. Grace and mercy is the icing. I love it. I love it. I'm stealing that for Sunday. That's right. So I want the presence of God. But to be in the presence of God, watch this. I want to go back to the analogy I just used. To be in the presence of God means I've got to cycle at the level and the speed at which God is cycling. I want you to notice that when my son and I were going down that hill, he sped up in front of me because he decided, he chose to go faster than what I was doing, right? If my presence was more important to him than speed, he would have said, okay, I've got to find a way to manage myself even down this steep hill so that I can stay in alignment with my father, right? There is some stuff. Oh, my goodness. I didn't mean to go here, but come on, guys. There is some stuff. That God wants to release into your atmosphere. There is some stuff that God is going to release over your family, over your destiny, and over your purpose. I want you to hear me. It is coming. But what we don't want to do is to run ahead of God. We don't want to ride ahead of God trying to get the thing that God was going to release to us anyway. I want you to know we would have gotten to the bottom of the hill even if he had just rode with me. Right, I want to get to where God has for me. Watch this with God, not in front of God, not behind God, with God. In the, in the book of Exodus, God tells Moses, uh, This is a stiff necked people, I'm not taking them into the promised land. Moses says to God in Exodus, If you don't go, we won't go without you. 
We would rather be with you in the desert than without you in our promised land. God says to Moses, well, if you got that much faith, come on, I'm going with you, right? That's the kind of level of intimacy and connectedness. Uh, uh, what's the word I want to use? Centrality. Uh, that we need to have when it comes to our relationship with the presence of God. I want to at all times be in alignment with God. I don't want to outspeed God going this. I want that's right. I, I want to go the speed of God. Right, 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 right. And so, and so in going the speed of God, what I discover is that it begins to help me manage some things about who I am and what I am. Right. In, in, in James 4, he talks a lot about lust. Well, when I'm going the speed of God, I begin to get authority and control over my body and my will. When I'm going the speed of God, I begin to get a, 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 a deeper understanding about my placement and my walk. I begin to see stuff I didn't see before. And so I want to make sure that I am always walking, riding, standing, being uh, in God's presence, going God's speed. Right, right. At least it says side by side, walking with the king. That's right. I don't need to outrun God because, listen, I want to get whatever God has. Right. That's the space and the place I want to be in. My goodness, y'all preaching my sermon for Sunday already. I love it. I love it. I love it. So, so, so again, James says, James says that in fourth chapter, verses seven and verses eight, we are to resist evil. And he will flee, uh, turn towards God, right? Right, draw near to God. And so the devil only flees because we have resisted and drawn near to God. The devil does not flee, again, just because you resisted. Great, glad you resisted. That was a wonderful first step. Please continue to do that. But it is in the drawing near to God that the devil realizes he got he only has a limited amount of resources. He needs to go somewhere else with his product. You know what I'm saying? It's economics 101. Right, right. And so the devil flees because you have drawn near and resisted to God, not simply because you just resisted. Do y'all get that? I think y'all got that. I want to move on to the next one. Uh, we got uh, uh, I got three of them in James 4. Um I want to deal with. Uh, so we've dealt with uh, verses 7 and verses 8. Again, we're in the fourth chapter of James. We're, we're, we're going straight Bible today. Uh, we'll we'll, we'll, we'll uh, get back to the text a little later. Um, straight Bible. Uh, James 4, verses 7 and 8. I want to also look at real quick uh, verse 10. Again, James 4, verse 10. James 4, verse 10. James 4, verse 10 reads like this. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Here is the profoundness of this statement. What, 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 what the text does not say, and this is very critical, this is very critical. The text does not say, humble yourself before God and men will exalt you. It does not say, humble yourself before God and the community will exalt you. It does not say, humble yourself and your children will exalt you. Humble yourself before God and your spouse will exalt you. It says, humble yourself before God and God will exalt you. Woo! Listen, 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 listen. Can I give it to you like this? Can I give it to you like this? What if I told you that the way in which God will exalt you might look a little different than the way in which your co-workers or your spouse or your children would exalt you? Right. And so what God is saying is whose praise do you really need? Whose praise do you really want? Do you want mine or do you want man's? Do you want your children's? Do you want your spouse's? Because the way I will exalt you will look different, sound different, feel different and give a different level of access and authority than that of those those around you. So I know you may have wanted the promotion. I know you may have wanted someone to clap when you came in. 
But God is saying that if you let me exalt you, uh, what will happen is I will open some doors that they could not have opened. I will place you in positions that they had no authority to put you in. They will wonder how you got to the place that you're getting. They will wonder how you got to the certifications and to the approvals. And it was simply because you allowed God to exalt you the way only God can exalt you. Y'all get that? Y'all get that? If I'm waiting on the crowd to applaud, then all I'm going to get is an applause. Congratulations. Right? But if I let God exalt me, watch this. God might not let the crowd applaud. Instead, God might just shift me to the next promotion. God might put me in a different position. God might release a new idea, a, a million-dollar thought uh, uh, into my mind. God might give me a dream, a dream that gives me deliverance in an area of my life that I've been struggling. God might release all kinds of things if I allow God to exalt me how God wants to exalt me. But if I'm waiting on someone else to exalt me, then I'm going to find that all I get is what they can give. Y'all get that? Deanna says, whose praise is more important? 100%. 100%. And an old pastor used to tell me that cologne smells good, but if you taste it, it's poison. <laughs> right? 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 Don't, don't get caught up on the smell goods. Right? 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 You, you drink it, it's poison. Right? 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 That's right. Uh, uh, Carla, says, uh, Carla says, sometimes it's not material. Oftentimes, Carla, oftentimes, the way in which God will exalt you is not material. Because God doesn't care about the material. Oftentimes, the way in which God will exalt you will be the release of revelation. It will be the access to, to, to new levels. It will be the repositioning of yourself um, in new esteem. God will often exalt us by repositioning us, often exalt us by giving us information or insight around something that is critical and crucial. And watch this, watch this. It is in the using, the doing of those things that we then get the kind of material success we were looking for, right? And so there's a revelation that God has for you, but God will only give it to you if you will humble yourself and allow him to exalt you, right? Right, right, right. But, but again, if all you want is a clap, I mean, we, we, we can clap for you all day. You, you won't get far, but we can, we can certainly clap for you. But let God exalt you by us humbling ourselves. Carolyn says, uh, what, what we see is limited. If we are humble, God will show us what we didn't think of. That's 100% correct. That's 100% that's correct. 100% correct. It is in our humbleness, in our humility, that God will begin to use and to release and to, and to restore. Let me tell you that there are whole hallways in heaven, whole hallways in heaven full of dreams and ideas and revelations and, and, and destiny that God is waiting to unlock and to open and to send to the people of God. There is, there, are, there is music that has never been heard before. There are sounds and movies and scripts and, 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 and cures to diseases and all kinds of things that God is simply waiting to unlock and open and to release to the body of Christ. But we will only receive it if we will humble ourselves before God. That's all we got to do. If we will humble ourselves before God, then God will release that access. God will release that level. God will, will exalt us through revelation, through signs, miracles, and wonders for us to receive because then God knows we will use it for its correct purpose. Does that make sense? And so we've got to humble ourselves before God. Let me hear some, some feedback on that, and then we'll jump to this. This is a really deep Bible study. I had about uh, uh, five uh, scriptures in, in James four. I wanted to, to, to look at. I might just do two more. I don't, it's, it's, this, this is this is heavy. This is heavy. But let me hear some thought um, around humbling yourself before God and what it looks like for God to exalt you. What does it look like? Um, what do you think about God exalting you and that being different than how man might do it? Let me hear some thought about God exalting you and how that might look different than man exalting you.
Carol says, I recognize the joy of my life as God's joy. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And joy is your weapon. Never give your joy or your peace to anybody else. Right? If, if somebody makes you mad, it's because you've given them your peace. That's right. That's right. Message version says, what now? Get down on your knees before God. It is only, it is, it is the only way that you will get back up on your feet. Woo, I like that. When God exalts us, it is our kingdom purpose. He puts us in places of influence. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Man's exalting might be based upon material gains. Listen, Anita, it is. It's, it's always because man can only do what man can do. And so it, man is limited by his own design. But God is infinite, right? Alicia says, cleansing your spirit and giving you peace. That's right. That's what it means. That's, that's one of the things about being exalted. Hmm. Right? It, it is a deliverance. It is a next level. It is a new access, right? Again, God is releasing to us revelation. God is releasing to us signs, miracles, wonders. God is releasing back to us our peace and our joy when he exalts us. Right? If we will humble ourselves, here's the thing, you can humble yourself. And the exaltation of God can simply be that you get your peace back. Right? 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 You've been struggling, working hard, doing all this for everybody, and no one has said a word about everything you're doing. But if you humble yourself before God, God will give you peace in that moment that surpasses understanding. God will give you joy in that moment. Carolyn says, uh, puts this joy in our heart. That's right. God will give you joy in that moment that surpasses understanding. And people will wonder why you have joy and wonder why you have peace. And the reason is because you learn to humble yourself before God. I love that. Carla says, be humble or be humiliated. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And so, again, when we allow ourselves to hum when we humble ourselves, God will exalt us. And in God's exaltation will always be different than man's exaltation. Again, man is limited by, by his constraints. The best humanity can do is what humanity has access to, right? Which is often just material stuff. So I can clap for you, um, but if you want a, a new revelation, then you better humble yourself and let God give you that, right? I can affirm you. I can say good job. Uh, but if you want God to give you access to a position and to a level uh, 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 that you have not been on, then you're going to need to humble yourself because only God can do that, right? And so and so there's a difference in, in exaltation when it comes from man versus versus God. That's right. That's right. Lifting me out is... Lift, Lifting me out of this pandemic coming ahead would be a good example of God exalting me through the promise. That's right. That's right. That's right. And only, only God can do that, right? Again, when we humble ourselves, we find that God will exalt us in only a way in which God can do, right? Okay, so, so we have dealt with some heavy stuff. We're not done yet. We're not done yet. So we dealt with uh, verses 7 and 8. Again, we're in James, the fourth chapter. Dealt with verses 7 and 8, that when we submit ourselves to God, uh, the text says that the enemy will flee um, um, when we, when, when, when we uh, um, resist, the, resist the devil, and he will flee, draw near to God, and God will draw near to us. And so we dealt with the fact that verse 7 is connected to verse 8. James 4, verse 7 is connected to verse 8. You cannot just resist the devil, but you must resist the devil and draw near to God. It is in the doing of those two things together that the enemy will flee. The enemy will not flee if you just resist. He'll wait. If you resist the, and, and do not draw near to God, the enemy will just wait you out because he knows you're coming right back. You let yourself be open. But if you resist and draw near to God, then the enemy will flee. Okay, we dealt with that. We dealt with verse 10, uh, humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. We dealt with the fact that God's exaltation is different than man's exaltation, right? And so if we want what man can offer, then certainly we don't need to humble ourselves. We can just be brash and arrogant and ignorant. But if we want the new level, the new, the new, the new re revelation uh, that God can offer, then we must humble ourselves before God and let God exalt us. And again, here's the thing. God's exaltation will always look different than man's exaltation. 
Always. 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 Because God is about releasing de destiny and legacy. God is about releasing revelation that causes the greatest impact for others. God is about positioning ourselves so that we're able to do good, to, to do justice for others. And so his exaltation is always connected to his destiny and to his purpose for our life. God's exaltation is always connected to his destiny and his purpose for our life. And so it will, it, it'll never be just about what you get. It will always be about what you can be given in order to give to others. Man, I'm preaching, and this is just Bible study. Listen to me. Let me say it again. It will, ne <laughs> it will never be about just what you can get, but it will always be about what you can be given so that you can give to others. That's how God will exalt you. That's why God will exalt you when we humble ourselves. Y'all got it? Y'all got it? Okay. So we dealt with verse 10. A uh, chaplain says that God considers humility a great virtue. That's right. <laughs> God <doesn't> said preach. <laughs> but, but humility is a great virtue. It is. It is. It is. I might not have modeled that uh, when I said I'm preaching. Uh, but, it, but, but, but but humility is a great it is, it is a great virtue. So we dealt with verses seven and eight. We dealt with verse ten. Um, I want to end uh, by dealing with verse twelve. Uh, verse twelve says this. Again, we're in James the fourth chapter. We've dealt with verses seven and eight. We've dealt, we've dealt with verses ten. I want to end by looking at verse twelve. And verse twelve says this. Um, there is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who you are, uh, but who are you to judge your neighbor? Oh, that's not the one I wanted to do. Um, I had I had I had four of them circled. Uh, the the, the, uh, the one I want to do. I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Uh, the one I want to do is verse 17. Verse 17. Again, James 4, chapter uh, James 4, verse 17. James 4. Verse 17, and it reads like this. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Here's where I want to end. Uh, whoever knows the right thing to do and does not do it, for him it is sin. That is the most concrete definition of what sin is that you will find in the entirety of the Bible. There's no greater definition. That definition doesn't let you out of anything, right? It simply asks you a question. Do you know that what you are doing is wrong? And if the answer is yes, then the, then the response is that is sin, right? right? Are you aware that your actions are not in, in alignment with God? If the answer is yes, uh, then, 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 then what you are engaged in is sin. Again, right, 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 right. Or I have a deeper calling in my life, and I cannot be ignorant anymore of going to serve God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so, and so what, what, what James challenges us to do is to not be ignorant anymore. It's to not allow ourselves, look, 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 to lie to ourselves, right? Because here's the reality. Either, either you know that what you're doing is of God or it's not of God. There, there, there's no maybe here. Right, right, right. If if either I'm following the will of God or I'm not, there's no kinda. I can't kinda be in sin and kinda be righteous. I can't, right, right. It's one or the other. And so what James says, most concrete definition we have of sin, if it ain't if it ain't of God, if it's wrong, is sin. Right? Again, James says, James says that whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it. To him, it's sin, right, 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 right. It's, it is, it is, it is literally that simple, right? Right. Deborah says, either you're in or you're out. That's it. Either you're in or you're not. I'm sorry. Either you're in or you're not. That's it. That's it. That's it. And so, and so, giving ourselves the license to say, okay, well, now that I recognize um, that what I'm doing is sin, then I have to ask myself. Am I ready to repent? To repent means to go the opposite direction. To repent means to go back to God. To repent is the answer to verse 8 of drawing near to God, right? That is repentance, 
right, right. Asking for forgiveness is the is the is the resisting, right, right, right. But to repent is to draw near to God. To repent is to turn and go in the opposite direction of sin. Right, so if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, and and know that it is sin, am I ready to repent? And here's the piece, y'all. If I'm not ready to repent, then what I am saying is I accept all consequences of my sin. <laughs> y'all not gonna like that. You're not gonna like that, but it's the truth. When you know that what you are doing is wrong, and you choose to do it anyway, what you are saying is that you sanction. All consequences related to your sin nature and your activity. That's what you're saying. You are, you are signing off on giving the enemy access to all of your stuff simply because you choose not to follow the will of God, right? And so what God wants to help us to do is to see our sin and to repent, to change direction, to go back to God, to draw near to God, not just to resist evil. It's one thing to say, well, I'm not going to talk bad about her, or I'm not going to go over his house again, or I'm not going to you know, go on that website, or I'm not going to drink this and smoke that again. That's one thing. It's a whole different thing to say, I'm going to get that out of my space and my aura. I'm going to change my lifestyle and my habits. I'm going to place myself in holy situations. I'm going to walk righteous before the Lord. I'm going to speak God's word. I'm going to do what God has called me to do. That's repentance. That's turning away from the sin. That's turning and going back towards God. Until you do that part, you are sanctioning. Sanctioning all that comes with it. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Y'all all right? <laughs> Y'all all right? I know this is heavy, man. That's my last one for tonight. I know this one is heavy. This one is heavy. James 4 is heavy. James 4 is heavy. But y'all can handle it, though. Y'all can handle it. Y'all can handle it. <laughs> So we have one more chapter in James 5. Um, we have one, one more chapter. Now, any, any other thoughts about that before I jump to James 5? <laughs> Chaplain says, preach and teach. <laughs> any, any other thoughts before I jump to James 5? Okay, so we have, we have one more chapter, uh, the fifth chapter of James. Um, 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 what, here's the thing I would like for each of you To read that chapter on your own um, Ebony and I And the kids are going on Vacation uh, for the next couple of weeks we, we, We're going back to the east coast To hang out with family uh, See some cousins and nephews And grandmothers and all that kind of stuff So I will not be available uh, For Bible study For the next two weeks That does not mean That your Bible suddenly disappears. That does not mean that the guide that you were given, the study guide that you were given, uh, um, uh, needs to disappear. What I'm going to encourage you um, is that for those who are online right now, I'm going to encourage you to use the next two weeks in your small group to create a small group and to finish the, the, uh, the study guide and to focus on the fifth chapter of James. So I'm going to encourage you to do that. Again, the next two Thursdays, uh, uh, I'm going to encourage you to get a small group together. Um, um, you've got the study guide in hand. And if you don't have the study guide, uh, certainly uh, you can go get a Bible and open up to the fifth chapter of James. Uh, I'm going to encourage you to do that. Um, oh, the Lord says, I wasn't on the beginning. What book are you going to use? We're still in, 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 in the same study guide. We're still in the same a study guide of uh, James, same same book, um, um, uh, but I'm going to encourage you to to uh, to get in your groups uh, and take two weeks. Oh, the uh, what is the next engaging book? Yeah, I, I think that's the question. So I went and got uh, let me pull it up, and we're going to have it on the website. It's called "Lord, Only You Can Change Me" by K. Author. Again, Lord, I don't know what my camera is. Lord, Only You Can Change Me by K. Author. Lord, only you can change me by K. Author. That is the next book we're going to begin, and Isaiah will make sure that is up on our website uh, by next week, and then Betsy will send out via email to others as well. Um, uh, Want to make sure we have that. Uh, but again, that will be the next book, and we will begin that the third week of August. So um, not next, not so these next two Thursdays, 
we won't do it. Who says upside down? Is it? Okay, I'm not. I'm not sure how that. Y'all help me. It's it's called Lord Only You Can Change Me. It's by K. Author, and we will make sure that it's up on the website um, and that it's sent out via the uh, the uh, the email from uh, Betsy. But again, these next two weeks we'll be on vacation. I see Rogers in Seattle. Yes, sir. Enjoy it, sir. Enjoy Seattle. We will be on the East Coast uh, back home. Um, uh, but I'm encouraging you to continue to finish the, the study on James and to focus on the fifth chapter uh, in your small groups. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Y'all are saying the book is backwards when I hold it to the camera. I'm not sure how else to hold the book. Um, <laughs> but I can tell you what it's called again. It's called Lord, Only You Can Change Me. Lord, Only You Can Change Me. And it's by K. Author. K. Author. Um, and again, um, Isaiah will have it up on the site, and then Betsy will, will, will send out uh, an email. Okay? Listen, I love you all. I have really enjoyed so is the t-shirt. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is our, this is our can for sure. Loving people, loving God. Okay. 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 Thank you, Deanna. Thank you. So <laughs> listen, I love you all. I have really enjoyed this study on James. Um, I can't wait to hear um, uh, how you're doing in your small groups uh, when, when we come back the, the third week of, of August to begin the new book. We'll take time in the beginning and talk about the lessons you learned from the uh, from James. Again, I want to encourage you, use our, our, our Camphor Facebook if necessary, but do not stop reading the Bible. Don't stop reading your, um, your study guides, uh, James, the, the, uh, the uh, fifth chapter. Again, get in your small groups and read that. Thank you all for the prayers uh, for my family as we travel. Uh, we haven't been home, and it wasn't, well, the kids have not been home uh, since Thanksgiving. Uh, so they are looking forward to seeing their cousins and playing with them. We'll, we'll be there for two weeks, and I'll get plenty of time to to drive us crazy. And so y'all pray for y'all pray for our nerves as we uh, <laughs> as we go and spend time with them. Listen again, God bless you. I love you. I thank God for each of you. Uh, may the peace of God, um, the power of God, the joy of God uh, be upon you and your your family. May the health of God. May every angel be available and dispatched to your household. May you know the fullness of God. May there be dreams of revelation. May you know God in such a way that shatters all perception that you've had before. And may this be a season of incredible breakthroughs, miracles, signs, and wonders. It is so in your life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, God bless you. I will see you all on Sunday for a sermon, and then we'll go from there.